Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Blake Society event for Wednesday, the 18th of September. Uh, we've got a very interesting guest um, talking to us this evening, um, Jake Elliott, who's going to talk to us about loss and the um, contemporary debate on London policing and how that ties into uh, Blake's depiction of that character. Before we get onto that, I'm just going to do the customary plugs. So first, uh, a plug generally for the Blake Society. I expect most of the people um, joining us this evening are already members. But if you're not, and this happens to be your first event with the Blake Society, first of all, welcome to you. And we hope you enjoy the evening. We put on normally an event uh, like this once a month and uh, we explore aspects of Blake's work, his life and all things relating to Blake. We're a membership organisation. So if you're interested in Blake and Blakeian matters, then please consider joining the society. It's £25 a year for membership or £15 for concessions. And it goes towards that money goes towards keeping all of these events going. We try to make the events free where we can to encourage the maximum um, participation in uh, in our explorations. But um, yeah, please, please consider joining the society next month. Uh, I say next month, but I think it's two weeks today, Wednesday, the 2nd of October. We have uh, an event in in real space. Um, uh, old fashioned in that sense, um, old school, I should say. And it's at the beautiful church of St. Bartholomew the Great in Smithfield in London. And it's called Songs of Innocence and Experience. And we'll be welcoming Katie Carr, who is a singer and musician, who will be performing some of the songs of innocence and, and of experience to her own settings. If you were at the um, the uh, meeting we had at Blake's grave in Bunhill Fields uh, last month, you would have heard and seen Katie perform a, a bit of a sneak preview for this event. And along with Katie, we will have our esteemed secretary, Stephen Pritchard, who will be reciting some of the songs and leading um, exploration of the uh, of the songs and their subjects. There was also going to be some of the artwork from the Songs of Innocence and of Experience projected as part of that uh, multimedia extravaganza. So we'll get to experience Blake uh, in his uh, what written visual forms and uh, musically. So um, this is one of the rare events we have, which we sometimes do when we're involving outside um, institutions where it will be a paid event. So it's uh, £10 for um, a ticket, but £8 for concessions. And uh, that includes Blake Society members. You can claim that concession rate as well. So please uh, check out more details of that on our website. If you go to the Blake Society website and look in the events section, you can find more information about the timings and a uh, link to book tickets for that event. Hope to see you there. So on to uh, tonight's event. Before I introduce our speaker properly, just the, uh, again, the customary housekeeping, we'll, um, Jake will speak to us for probably about half the event, probably 40 minutes or so. During that, if you could please keep your um, cameras off and yourselves muted, just so there's no uh, interruptions or distractions during Blake's, uh, Blake's talk, Jake's talk. Um, that'd be good to have Blake as well. And uh, and then after Jake has finished the presentation, we will have uh, questions and answers, at which point you can um, show yourselves to us all. And um, and we'll hopefully have lots of great questions for Jake to uh, to respond to. So uh, the title of the talk, Blake's Watchman, Loss and the London Police. I met Jake a few months ago in May this year at um, an event at Keats House, beautiful Keats House in North London. And Jake gave a talk which um, was a shorter version of the more, um, the longer and more in-depth exploration of this subject we're going to get this evening. It was really fascinating. Uh, so we asked Jake to, uh, to come and talk to us about it this evening. Brief introduction, uh, Jake is a third year PhD student at the University of Roehampton. 
His research explores how Blake's depictions of London interact with other contemporary understandings of the metropolis, with a particular emphasis on visual cultures. So that just gives you a little background on uh, where Jake is coming from. And now I think without further ado, if I could ask Jake to uh, unmute himself and uh, show himself to us, we'll ask him to uh, talk to us about this fascinating subject. Jake, over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, John. And thank you to the Blake Society for inviting me along today. And uh, thank you all for coming along. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, so as John says, I'm just going to speak for about 40 minutes um, on this topic. I'm going to share my slide with you now. Uh, and then I'm really looking forward to having a good discussion uh, about Blake afterwards, because that is always a fun thing to do. Uh... Okay, lovely. Um, right, okay, I'll just jump straight into it. Um, so in 1829, Robert Peel's Metropolitan Police Bill passed in Parliament, creating a unified police district in London for the first time. While the City of London itself, measuring only one square mile, was excluded, the policing of the remainder of the metropolis came under the direct control of the Home Office. Suddenly, Peel's new bobbies, dressed in blue, became a ubiquitous presence in the capital, while the parochial watchman, or Charlie, was cast from London streets into the history books. For centuries, each local parish in London had collected rates from its inhabitants and used this income to fund the watch, a body of local men who patrolled the streets after nightfall. This system, however, had come under increased scrutiny at the turn of the 19th century. Patrick Colquhoun's influential treatise on the police of the metropolis, published in 1796, had argued that a wide ranging police institution was necessary to replace the watch. While less charitably, John Pearson described the watch as constituted by men blind in one eye, crippled with one or both legs, and deaf as a post. So there should be another slide. Oh, so it's me one moment. Sorry about this. Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. Um, so the print, The Last of the Charlies, published by John Field, dramatically visualizes the eventual demise of the local parish watch in 1829. The scroll by the watchman's feet declares that Mr. Charlie was found dead this morning, supposed to have been run over by a policeman, implying a brutal supplanting of the watch by Peel's new bobbies. The decrepit and dishevelled figure is surrounded by the detritus of his broken implements. His wooden rattle lays in pieces by his exposed feet, while his lamp is extinguished and broken. The print depicts a moment of sudden, even comedic displacement, an overdue reckoning for the ancient figure of the watchman and his rudimentary instruments. This stark opposition between modern Bobby and outmoded Charlie, however, downplays various moves towards centralisation, which had preceded Robert Peel's act. The 1792 Middlesex Justices Act, for example, had created seven police offices funded directly by the Home Office, while the 1798 Thames Police Act had created a central police force charged with protecting trading interests on London's river. There had also been several attempts to modernise the local watch system in this period. Richard Whitworth's 1774 Westminster Night Watch Act had, for example, created more uniformity between the various parishes with a law which enshrined minimum wage rates and precise hours of duty for the watchman. With these examples in mind, it is difficult to characterise 1829 as a clean break. Instead, London's policing structures had for decades constituted a mixture of centralised and local oversight, battling in both Parliament and press for the future of London's policing. William Blake's representations of the metropolis in the early 19th century seem on the surface unconcerned with these issues. In Milton and Jerusalem, London is the site where Lowe's battles to prevent Albion from succumbing to the forces of abstract rationality and morality. Within these cosmic struggles, there seems little room for the niceties of London's policing legislation. Yet Blake's identification of, of Lowe's as Albion's watchman 
can be viewed as an intervention in the debate which raged in the years leading up to Peel's bill. Morton Palin has argued that the figure portrayed in the frontispiece to copy E of Jerusalem is loose in the guise of a London night watchman, engaged in an act of self-sacrifice in descending into the interior of Albion. Blake's figure in this image lacks the coarseness found in many other contemporary depictions of the watchman. Instead, Lose's youthful and classical features, combined with his sandaled feet and the glowing orb in his hand, imbue him with a mythological vigour. The duality of this image, Lose's both mythologised figure and recognisable London type, allows us to place Blake's work in dialogue with the debate around London's policing, providing insights into how his depictions of visionary and hellish cityscapes interact with and differ from contemporary debates about how to police the capital. This exploration of Blake's interactions with contemporary policing structures will begin with an examination of a letter Blake wrote to the publisher Richard Phillips in 1807, in which he decries the entrapment and arrest of the astronomer Robert Powell. Mr. Powell's arrest, summary trial at the Hatton Garden Police Office and his trial at the Middlesex Quarter Sessions, which is traceable in contemporary newspapers and print publications, provides an intriguing insight into a lived experience of London's police structures in the years preceding 1829. Blake's letter to Phillips exposes an awareness of how these structures operated, inviting us to explore how Blake's concerns in the letter leave their traces in his poetic output. To this end, I will draw a parallel between the centrally funded police offices, funded in 1792, and the figure of Eurism, whose centralising or abstracting impulse is a key feature in Blake's prophetic works. I will then explore how the presence of the Society for the Suppression of Vice at Powell's quarter session trial evokes the figures of the watch fiends in Blake's work. From here, I will then return to the identification of Loesser's watchman and explore how he opposes the outlooks of Eurism and the watch fiends by embracing a localised, multiple view of urban space. In October 1807, Blake wrote an indignant letter to the publisher Richard Phillips about the arrest of a Robert Powell, a self-proclaimed astrologer deemed an imposter for charging others to read their futures in the stars. After reading an account of Powell's arrest in the Daily Advertiser the day before, Blake reached out to Phillips in his capacity as Sheriff of the City of London, someone bound to attend to the matter. Blake's indignation was aroused by the efforts of a Mr. Blair, who upon receiving one of Powell's handbills advertising his services, sent a footman to entrap the astrologer before his eventual arrest by the Hatton Garden constables. Blake describes this entrapment, which caused the police to seize upon the persons and goods or property of Powell, as evoking the quote, cold fury of Robespierre. For Blake, Powell represents a harmless figure, oppressed by the influence of the stars in the same manner that Newtonians are oppressed by their own reasonings and experiments. The intrusion of the police into Powell's personal dwelling and the seizure of his property, property constituted for Blake an arbitrary reaction reminiscent of the excesses of Robespierre during the years of terror after the French Revolution. With Blake's description of Loesser's Albion's watchman in mind, what is particularly striking about Powell's arrest is the total absence of the parochial watch. Where traditionally the watch would apprehend lawbreakers after dark before bringing them before a traditional justice of the peace, the creation of seven police officers via the 1792 Middlesex Justices Act created an efficient, self-sustaining mechanism for the apprehension and prosecution of criminals. These officers were modelled upon the Bow Street Police Office, established in 1740 by the magistrate Sir Thomas Deville and later run by Henry Fielding. However, where the Bow Street Office had investigated crimes as an uno unofficial body, each of the seven new offices represented an official, governmentally financed institution. Each office employed six constables who could liaise with members of the public to apprehend those breaking the law, while free stipendiary magistrates dispense summary justice at the offices. Summary justice, where the accused would either be fined, dismissed, or sent to a more advanced court, had previously been relatively informal, even taking place at the homes of the non-stipendiary justices of the peace. In the official police offices, however, summary justice was a regulated activity taking place from 10 in the morning until 8 at night. It is within this regulated, punctual system that Powell's initial arrest by the Hatton Garden constables occurred. The, bypass, the bypassing of the watch system seen in, seen in Powell's case became increasingly common after, in the years after 1792. 
but it was by no means ubiquitous. While the police at office constables were becoming more active in, atten in attending to crime, the watch would still bring those apprehended to the stipendary magistrate at the police office for summary justice, creating intriguing points of contact between ancient and modern forms of policing. Pierce Egan's novel, Life in London, published in 1821, provides a useful, though fictional counterpoint to Powell's arrest by bringing the new police office into direct contact with the ancient figure of the watchman, less than a decade between, before Robert Peel's bill. After a scuffle on one of their many sprees, Egan's roguish anti-heroes, Corinthian Tom and Captain Jerry Hawthorne, are apprehended by a watchman and kept overnight in the watch house before being presented before a magistrate at the Bow Street Police Office the next morning. Egan's watchman, named Barney, is portrayed as an unkempt and unscrupulous figure. He theatrically clutches a series of pro props, including a broken lantern and a damaged rattle, designed to prove the damage done to his property at the hands of Tom and Jerry. The stipendiary magistrate, however, is lent a knowing, even noble quality. After settling a dispute between an unpaid cab driver and a penniless woman, the magistrate turns his attention to Tom, Jerry and Barney and notes that he has no alternative but to order the expenses of the watchman to be paid for the damage, as the latter had formed for it. Tom and Jerry take the hint, make their bows to the justice, settle the difference with the Charlie before leaving to embark on another of their adventures. The watchman is exhibited here as a hindrance while the magistrate attends to his work, a farcical anachronism who does not fit into the enlightened space of the police office. Tom and Jerry seem to share a level of understanding or sympathy with the magistrate's compromise, but they later take the revenge on the institution of the watch by pushing over a watch box with watchmen inside later in the novel. The tacit approval of the centralised system seen in life in London is one that contrasts starkly with Blake's work, which through the figure of Eurism often critiques the moral or spatial uniformity such systems produce. In the seventh night of the four zones, for example, Eurizen enters the space in which Orc has been chained to and has subsequently fused with a rock. Eurizen, fixed in envy at the sight of the passionate Orc, broods upon the dreadful letters of his Book of Iron, which contains his fixed moral law. Suddenly, a deadly root emerges from under Eurizen's hill, which shoots up and branches into the heaven of Lois, before bending down and taking root again wherever they touch again branching forth in intricate labyrinths overspreading many a grisly deep. From the central node of Eurism emerges a proliferating structure which displays a material uniformity as it overshadows the flames of Orc. The image of an interlaced structure issuing from Eurism recurs throughout Blake's output, often in a distinctly, distinctly metropolitan setting. In the Book of Eurism, for example, Blake describes how Eurism, wandering on high over his sun cities, produces a cold shadow like a spider's web, which divides the dungeon-like heaven and causes a hardening of the bones and a shrinking of the senses of the inhabitants below. The depiction of a centralised web restraining the senses of those within the cities exhibits striking parallels with the use of the police offices in the 1790s, where police magistrates became key figures in government spy networks. The police officers provided a communicative link between informers and the Home Office during this decade, allowing the latter to spread their net, to infiltrate, to disrupt, and to some degree neutralise radical groups such as the London Corresponding Society. Powell's arrest may not have been directly related to seditious activity, but it represents another use of the mechanism of the police officers, one which allowed stipendiary constables to enter the private dwelling of Powell and confiscate his belongings. In contrast to the positive portrayal of the police office in Egan's life in London, therefore, Blake critiques the idea of an integrated system emerging from a central point through the repressive and restrictive actions of Eurism. After his processing through the new centralised police offices, Powell was ordered to the quarter sessions at the Sessions House in Glarkenwell. The quarter sessions, which delivered verdicts on criminal cases beyond the remit of summary justice, had largely been untouched by the changes of 1792. The presence of William Mainwaring, the MP for Middlesex, who had chaired the sessions for decades, shows a continuity which contrasts with the newly established police officers. In many ways, Mainwaring represented a throwback to the paternalistic, potentially corrupt, 
justice who had overseen local justice for centuries. Unsavory rumors had accompanied, accompanied Mayan Warren's granting of liquor licenses for decades, and he had vigorously opposed the aborted police bill of 1785, which had um, pushed for a centralized police force um, a few decades before um, Robert Peel's eventual bill. Thomas Rowlandson's print, A Brace of Public Guardians, provides an intriguing look into the quarter sessions, likening its corrupt practices to the perceived incompetence of the watchman. Where Egan had contrasted the antiquated and unprincipled watchman with the efficiency of the stipendiary magistrate in life in London, Rowlandson portrays the street and the quarter sessions as two related spaces, both home to the corruption which infects aspects of the policing system without central oversight. The role that the Society for the Suppression of Vice played in the conviction of Powell at the quarter sessions, however, complicates the idea that Powell's case escaped from modern policing methods after it left the Hatton Garden Police Office. While the Society was technically an extrajudicial body, its influence also extended into judicial spaces, where, as in Powell's trial, the prosecution would be actively assisted by the Society. Founded in 1802, the Society for the Suppression of Vice embodied a shift in approach to crime, one based on its prevention through a careful policing of public morality. The Society also, however, were active in helping the law when vice stepped beyond the immoral into the criminal. This was a group whose membership spanned various professions and social stations, overlapping with the Anglican clergy, men in professional and commercial life, and as in the case of Patrick Colkin, who was a constable at the Shoreditch Police Office, official policing bodies. Bound by the conception of the constituted vice, this leveraged their state and um, this group leveraged their status to influence society in several spheres, from the live space of the public house to the legal space of the quarter sessions. There are not many contemporary visual references to the society for the suppression of vice, but Charles Williams' 1816 print named City Scavengers Cleansing the London Streets of Impurities gestures towards the influence of the group, albeit in a comic manner. A scroll at the bottom of the image reads, by particular desire of the Society for the Suppression of Vice, it is ordered that city officers to keep the streets clear of common prostitutes and otherly disorderly persons, while city officials marshal a group of women into a cart to be escorted away. The motives of those undertaking this task are ambivalent. After all, one of the women declares that her assailant must be made of either stone or wood to act in such a manner. But the presence of the Society looms over this image as they attempt to direct the moral ca character of the capital from beyond the frame of the print. Fortunately, we know about the extent of the involvement of the Society for the Suppression of Vice in Powell's trial, thanks to a tract that they published in 1808. In the tract, we learn that Mr. Blair, the man who entrapped Powell initially, was a member of the Society. After Powell's arrest, Blair had put the secretary of the Society Secretary of the Society in possession of Powell's books, papers, and other documents. Utilizing these seized documents, the prosecution exam examined various figures, including Blair, Powell, and the constable who had initially arrested him. The details uncovered during this process complicate Blake's depiction of Powell as a star added innocent. His papers reveal proof of lies to the court regarding details of his family, while there appears to be a manipulative quality to his reading. Yet despite this, Blake's dismay at the unsanctioned seizure of property by a group operating beyond the official remit of the police would not have abated during the trial of the quarter sessions, where detail after detail from Powell's private papers were divulged and eventually published. Interestingly, Blake's outrage at Powell's arrest appears to have been echoed by many others. Mr. Blair, the member of the society that entrapped Powell, printed identical letters in the Morning Post and the Morning Chronicle in early November 1807 in an attempt to obviate, to quote, obviate the ill effect of the misrepresentations which have gone abroad regarding the case. These letters even included a sample of the exchanges at the quarter sessions as part of the effort to convince readers that the incarceration of power was a benefit to the public. This endeavour, however, appears to have failed. The appendix of the Society's publication of the details of the trial even refers to the misrepresentations which had been industriously circulated by different newspapers 
and he rages against the glosses and the errors which litter their articles. Another telling detail at the end of the society's tract also shows that rather than continuing to distoke debate in the mainstream press, the society decided to limit the readership of this publication. At the end of the appendix, we read that by a resolution of the committee, it was ordered that the work will not be published or sold, but, quote, distributed gratis with the information only of the police magistrates and of such gentlemen as are members of the Society for the Suppression of Vice. The tract is unceremoniously withdrawn from the circuits of wide, widespread publication, accessible only to the initiate and untroubled by scrutiny or contradictory narrative. The shadowy features of the Society for the Suppression of Vice and the spread of their members across different professions and their unwillingness to communicate beyond closed circuits create an unsettling duality of presence and absence. The group exists beyond the official workings of the police of the metropolis, yet the weight of its accumulated influence is undeniable in instances such as the arrest and trial of power. These fugitive crusaders for the prevention of vice share some striking similarities with watch fiends in Milton and Jerusalem, providing another appealing echo in Blake's work of London's contemporary police instructions. In Milton, Blake describes the dwellings of Satan's watch fiends as the tyrannical pillars of temperance, prudence, justice, and fortitude, the four cardinal virtues which in Blake's poem become embodied as oppressive tyrannical structures. In Jerusalem, Blake goes further and details the activities of these fiends who dwell within the pillars of moral certainty. He describes a grain of sand in Lambeth, one which is translucent and contains innumerable angles, which are all open into a lovely heaven, which the watch fiends are tirelessly trying to locate. Blake states that if the fiends ever found this grain, they would call it sin and lay its heavens and their inhabitants in blood of punishment. The watch fiend's intrusive actions suggestively mirror Blake's representation of power as a harmless eccentric under the influence of the stars, one whose property is seized upon by the cold fury of the Society for the Suppression of Vice and the police office constables. Blake envisions them entering the private space of the translucent grain of sand and converting it into a means for judgment and punishment. Blake even connects the covert activities of the watch fiends with Eurizen's restrictive architectures when he describes how the watch fiends utilise the scroll of mortal life to condemn the accused, trembling in spectrous bodies at Satan's bar. Unlike Eurizen's web of intricate labyrinths overspreading the deep, these spectrous bodies spread outwards, entangling the accused within their systems. The watch fiends, like the Society for the Suppression of Vice, are instrumental in keeping these systems going by offering it new individuals ready for judgment. So far then, we have seen how Blake's expression of distrust towards the cold fury of the police in his letter to Richard Phillips can also be read in his contemporary prophetic works. The collaboration between the constables of, Hatton, of the Hatton Garden Police Office and the Society for the Suppression of Vice and the Arrest and the Judgment of Power find suggestive echoes in the figures of Eurozen and the watch fiends in Blake's work. The former centralising impulse, combined with the latter's attempt to find Blake's translucent grain of sand, creates an interlocking system, one which embodies both official centralised policing and the society for the suppression of vices extrajudicial interest in society's morals. I will now, however, turn to Loos and his role within Blake's work as Albion's watchman. Lois's casting as London Watchman links him, I will argue, to a localised view of metropolitan space, which contrasts the legal and moral, the moral and legal systems embodied by Eurozen and the watch fiends. Lois's mission as local watchman attempts to open London into visionary realms which preserve, rather than corrode, what he defines as the minute particulars of humanity. Before exploring how Blake's depiction of Lois and Salvian's watchman reinforces the importance of the minute particulars of human experience, however, it is important to note that Lois's role as watchman is not preordained in Blake's work. It's instead one that Lois grows into gradually as Blake's mythic universe expands. Ironically, the first time Lois is mentioned in relation to a watchman is in the four zoas when Enetharmon, his emanation, who is trapped in Eurizen's web-like structure described earlier, cries out in terror 
pleading for the assistance of a watchman in the following lines. I hear the watchman, hear of not. I cry the watchman, hear of not. I pour my voice in roarings. Watchman, the night is thick and darkness cheats my rainy sight. Lift up, lift up, O light. Awake my watchman, because he sleepeth. Lift up, lift up, shine forth, O light. Watchman, thy light is out. Here, Lois is explicit, explicitly separate from the station of the watchman. Enna Farman calls for Lois to awake the watch after her voice goes unheard. Instead, in this way, she calls not to Lois himself, but to the humble parochial watchman who remains beyond the range of her voice and whose light remains out. Despite the failure of the watchman to respond to Enna Farman and the separation between the figure of the watchman and Lois at this moment in the Four Zoras, her call to the watch is intriguing. It is based on an almost instinctive trust in the institution of the watch to extricate her from Eurus' instructions. It's worth dwelling on this for a moment because Enna Thalman's call echoes that of many contemporary Londoners, Londoners who believe this unfashionable figure was preferable to a body of centrally funded police officers. In fact, until the 1780s, there had been little appetite for or discussion about the central police force. Most legislative activity of the period was instead focused upon improving the parish watch. Of course, the effects of the Gordon riots, the re-emergence of the movement uh, for the reformation of manners, the political fears of the 1790s, and the Ratcliffe Highway murders in 1811, to name just a few factors, changed the statutory emphasis on the improvement of the watch. Yet even when the debate shifted to the introduction of new policing bodies, the figure of the watchman was often used by those concerned by the potentially tyrannical uses of these bodies. John Prince Smith's An Account of a Successful Experiment for an Effectual Night and Watch, which was published in 1812, contains a robust defence of the institution of the watch in the wake of the Ratcliffe murders of 1812. Smith's work, uh, which was interestingly published by Richard Phillips, who appears to have ignored Blake's letter, both outlines the changes Smith would have made to the current watch system, while also detailing, detailing an experiment in which all the inhabitant housekeepers and the liberty of the rolls, which was Smith's parish, undertook to patrol the district each night in turn in the immediate aftermath of the Ratcliffe murders. The Ratcliffe Highway murders, in which seven members of two families were brutally murdered near Wapin, without any apparent motive for the killer, had created widespread panic throughout the capital, providing ammunition for those arguing about the inadequacy of the parochial watch. Smith, however, urged caution. He states that the watch that could arrest the hand of the Ratcliffe murderer would have to have had the powers of both omnipresence and ubiquity, two qualities which he believes to be incompatible with a proportionate police force. He argues that all a good police can do is to prevent the escape of offenders with the use of a nightly guard as all other systems are a system of tyranny and organised army of spies and informers for the, dest the destruction of all public liberty. For Smith, the shock of the Ratcliffe murders should not be co-opted to over overhaul the ancient institution of the watch and to replace it with a centralised police force. This, he argues, would represent authority making an assumption of new power subduing in disguise that liberty which open violence cannot destroy. John Prince Smith's work, therefore, represents a ter terrestrial echo of Enna Farman's instinctual call to the watchman in the four zones. Both respond to a move towards centralization. Eurozone's tree-like structure weaves its roots around Enna Farman, while Smith worries about the statutory response to an event, to an event which rightly alarmed the whole metropolis. This sense of the watchman as opposed to arbitrary central power is one that even extends beyond debates about policing into other political areas. Charles James Fox, for example, was portrayed as the watchman of Westminster in a Rowlandson print published in a history of the Westminster election containing every material occurrence, which covered the Westminster election of 1784 in minute detail. Fox's rapture, 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 <laughs> Rapture, oh, I can't say that word, my apologies, and um, received victory over the government backed candidates, Lord Hood and Sir Cecil Ray, relied upon and reinforced his reputation as a parliamentary man of the people, one upholding the Whig cause of reform against the vested interests of the establishment. 
Rollington's image catches this, catches this by showing shoddily dressed rain and boots retreating from blocks, whose light is ascribed with the word truth and whose stick stands for uprightness. The station of the watchman is here utilised to show Fox as uncovering corruption, shining the light of truth on political hypocrisy as the guardian of the rights and privileges of the people. Blake himself voted for Charles James Fox at the subsequent 1790 election, and it is conceivable that he was aware of and even potentially influenced by this imagining of Fox as Westminster's watchman. This print may also have influenced Samuel Taylor Coleridge's naming of his journal The Watchman, which in, um, which in its own words, promised reserved freedom and her friends from the attacks of robbers and assassins. These villains are identified as the editors of weekly provincial papers who uncritically print the official prints or articles of the treasury, who in some instances marked particular pa paragraphs for insertion. Coleridge rails against the idea of the dissemination of political knowledge radiating from the central source of the treasury promising his journal will be a faithful watchman, willing to proclaim the state of the political atmosphere by publishing a range of material from a variety of sources. In both Rowlandson's print and Coleridge's journal, the watchman becomes a prophetic personification of truth, resistant to the corruption which spreads outwards from a tyrannical central authority to undermine liberty. It is also this resistance to centralised or arbitrary authority which informs Blake's depiction of Lois as watchman. By the time Blake printed his first copy of Jerusalem in 1820, Lois is no longer the separate is no longer separate from the absent watchman and if Arnold calls to in the Four Sirens. Instead, he fully inhabits the role, taken on the mantle of Albion's watchman, as Albion the universal man, is divided by the forces of abstraction and morality. Like John Prince Smith, Coleridge and Rowlandson in The Watchman of Westminster Prince, Blake utilises the unfashionable figure of the watchman to resist systems of tyranny. From the shadowy religious ceremonies of Barla to Eurism's fixed moral and spatial architectures. But to fully understand Blake's and Lois's opposition to abstracted moral systems, it's important to define a subtle distinction in Blake's work. That between a whole composed of minute particulars and a whole generated from an aggregate. In his annotations to Reynolds' discourses, for example, Blake states that one central form composed of all other forms being crafted, it does not therefore follow that all other forms are deformity. In this quite wordy sentence, Blake insists that the constituent elements of one central unified structure have their own value without conforming absolutely to the whole. But within this larger structure, it is possible to sustain forms which, while different to the totality, are not the deformity. In this annotation, Blake is describing visual arts, but this basic principle is extended to the moral law in Jerusalem, when Loos states that he who wishes to see a vision, a perfect whole, must see it in its minute particulars. Organised and not as thou, a fiend of righteousness, pretendest. You smile with pomp and rigour, you talk of benevolence and virtue. I act with benevolence and virtue and get murdered time after time. You accumulate particulars and murder by analysing them. You may take the aggregate and call the aggregate moral law. Blake insists that vision is a perfect whole, constituted of minute particulars, which while organised are not simply micro embodiments but a macro structure. To borrow from Blake's annotations to Reynolds, these minute particulars are not deformities, but are the translucent grains of sand, the particles of divine life, which the watch fiends seek out to destroy. When particulars are accumulated, analysed and aggregated, they lose their individuality and the moral law becomes Eurizen's web, a geometric uniform structure which cannot process any an anomaly or slight deviation. Lois experiences the destruction of the minute particulars himself when patrolling the streets of London in chapter two of Jerusalem. Blake describes how fearing that Albion should turn his back against the divine vision, Lois takes his globe of fire to search the interiors of Albion. The globe in Lois's hand and the implication of the threshold and the movement to the interiors links this moment to the frontispiece of Jerusalem discussed earlier. 
Strikingly, at this moment in the poem, Moses' movement into the interiors of Al Albion through the caves of despair and death morphs into the streets of the metropolis as Los, quote, came down from Highgate through Hackney and Holloway towards London till he came to Old Stratford and thence to Stepney and the Isle of Luther's Dogs. During this patrol, Lo sees the effects of turning the minute particulars of humanity into an aggregate. Lo sees, quote, every minute particular, the jewels of Albion running down the kennels of the streets and lanes as if they were aboard, finding no human form as he took his way until he looks upon Albion City with many tears. It is the blending of Eurozone's moral law and the streets of London which causes this effect. The geometric structures of Eurozone transform the minute particulars of human experience into barren mountains of moral virtue. This passage in Jerusalem, however, does not constitute the only moment which can be linked to the frontispiece of the poem. Lois once again forays into Albion spaces in chapter four of the poem, when in a patrol similar to the one described above, he rises to quote, go on his march. In this instance, however, Lois' sustained interaction with London spaces reveals the human potential beyond yours and systems. Before leaving upon this watch, Lois describes himself as the labourer of ages in the valleys of despair, describing the surrounding land as desolate unless the seeds of cities are planted in the human bosom. Though all must lie in confusion till Albion's time of awaking, these seeds prevent an eternal death before the day when Jerusalem emanates again in eternity. Lois's emphasis on the spatial confusion which must reign until the day of Albion's awakening and the restoration of his emanation Jerusalem is particularly important. Where Eurozone's web of torment creates a spatial and moral uniformity, integrating all particulars through a process of aggregation, Lois understands that difference and particularity is an integral part of his prophetic project. With these statements made, Lois starts upon his watch, insisting to his sons that they listen to your watchman's voice. During this movement, the barren mountains and caves of despair were replaced with the dynamic stars rising and setting and the meteors and terrors of the night, while his emanation, Lois's emanation, quote, like a faint rainbow waves before him in the awful gloom of London City on the Thames from Surrey Hills to Highgate. London at this moment turns from the barren wasteland it was previously to the human awful wonder of God. A series of spaces continually building and continually decaying in which Jerusalem, the emanation of the Sydney Albion, can be fugitively glimpsed. In this conception of metropolitan space, the restrictive tendencies of Eurozim and the Watchpins are replaced by Lois's careful watch over the minute particulars of human experience and his awareness that within the conflicting states and spaces which make up the fallen material world, Albion's visionary emanation, Jerusalem, waits. To conclude then, Blake's uh, depictions of Lois's watchman labouring to save Albion City London from the forces of abstraction were printed within a bustling city whose methods of policing itself were in flux. The parochial watch system, London's primary mode of policing itself for decades, was gradually being eroded by new forms of policing, by the police offices created by the Middlesex Justices Act in 1792, and groups focused on public morality, such as the Society for the Suppression of Vice. Blake's visual and poetic depictions of Losa's Watchmen are idiosyncratic, but not isolated in this context. The Watchman was merc mercilessly deployed as a figure of fun and as a dangerous anachronism, but also as a symbol of resistance to the perceived creep of tyrannical systems. Placing Blake's Jerusalem within this rich debate about the policing of London spaces gives us another tool for unpacking the multiple poetic, visual and spatial dynamics within Blake's late, late epic a work which, like London itself, blends the particular and the general, the local and the central, and the transient and the eternal. Let's be finished. Thank you very much, Mr. Listening.
have I turned myself on? Yes. Jake, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I am quietly confident that there are going to be lots of uh, questions and uh, thoughts that people have in response to that. Um, so just to go over how we facilitate that, um, easiest way for people to let us know. Oh, please feel free to put your cameras on now, by the way, so we can see who is uh, with us this evening. It makes it feel a bit... Uh, a bit cheerier and like we're not just uh having a conversation in some sort of weird abstract space It'd be very eurogenic obviously um yeah please feel free to um if you go to the react uh button at the bottom of your screen seems to be where zoom's put it now and press on the heart i think within that there's a raise hand icon and then if you um press that we'll see who wants to ask a question and then we'll invite you to do so and our uh Backstage tech wizards can uh, highlight you uh, and we can uh, get you talking to Jake. Um, if you're not able to do that for any reason or just feeling a bit shy, um, put your question in the chat as well and I can um, read those out. Uh, while we are letting people's thoughts um, form, I was going to, I might kick off if I may, use my um, privilege as host. So I was listening to a podcast about uh bob dylan the other day and it was about uh the song uh all along the watchtower yeah. and i hadn't realized that uh one of the kind of references that bob is drawing on in that is from uh the book of isaiah apparently oh, in which yeah. there is a lot of talk about uh the the watchman and i think that's where the phrase go set a watchman which i'm am i right in thinking that was harper lee's posthumous novel took that title I don't know why I haven't read it. Um, so that's, I wonder whether you had any comments or thoughts on that, Jake, the way that this, um, the kind of biblical precedent of that image of the watchman feeds into Blake's use of that, um, that sort of symbol or metaphor. And I guess also the, the wider debate that he was drawing on, um, given that the society which that all came from was obviously much more religious and biblically literate than we are. Oh, uh, thank you for the question, John. Um, that's something that I have been thinking about a bit. Um, I feel like I definitely need to make it talk more to kind of the contemporary watchman. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it's um, the two definitely function together. I think um, the idea of, um, I suppose, like kind of, as I was talking about God's Watchman is kind of um, linked to the idea of prophecy, I suppose, in the way that you're um, keeping something safe in a way, despite everything that might be kind of happening around them, and um, to sort of keep that presence of God um, for, for for people to like to be able to access at some point. And I think that's very similar to um, kind of what. Um, Lois's mission is um, within London. It seems like it's not, it's not so much kind of an active um, changing of London. It's more kind of preserving something within its streets, and so that when something changes, when the time comes, they can and um, like flourish into something different. So I, I think, yeah, it's really it's really um, interesting thinking about like kind of prophecy in relation to kind of London in that time as well. Is that, is that preservation of like kind of a divineness? Uh, that can't kind of quite flourish in the present, but yeah, keeping it, keeping it like kind of hidden and keeping it safe, just kind of quite Lord of the Rings, uh, until um, until it's ready to kind of come forth into the world. Um, and yeah, I really love Bob Dylan as well. So it's um, it's always really great getting links between um, Blake and Bob Dylan. I listened to him in Chimes of Freedom, Freedom again recently, and it's so great here, like the furnace, the city's melted furnace. And, yeah, um, really good over that. So. There's definitely some direct, I mean, I think there's stuff they have in common anyway, the sources mm -hmm. there, but also there's definitely some direct, I mean, I'm not a, a Dylan expert, like I know people get really obsessed with Dylan as, in the same way that we're obsessed with Blake, but um, I, I, I realised relatively recently that in the, you know, the video for, um, is it Subterranean Homesick Blues, where he's like standing there with yeah. the lyrics on the card, which I was presumed was in New York, just because it looks like New York. Yeah, and that was like Allen Ginsberg standing in the background, looks sort yeah. of like this kind of trampy guy in the background. It's more or less where Blake died. It's like the back streets behind the where the Savoy is now, which no. is a coincidence, right? I can't find anything no. about it online, but it can't be a coincidence that Ginsberg, 
like took Dylan there to film that. But I don't know, maybe wow. it is. That's incredible. I had no idea it was. Yeah, it looks so New York. There's like the fire yeah. escape in the background, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's because it's all like the kitchens and stuff, you know, and where the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I wonder where, the, yeah, because they're, they're, I mean, I literally found out about this a few days ago listening to this excellent podcast and Bob Dylan, but it seems to be uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel as well, I think, that have this kind of thing of the watchman and the watch. And uh, yeah, as you say, it does seem to be linked to the idea of a prophet almost as a metaphor of the prophet as someone who sort of um, bears witness to the truth and and proclaims, which is, again, would tie in with uh, with Los Olos as the sort of uh, mm -hmm. the, the figure of, of uh, yeah, like preserving almost by seeing, right, like by doing that patrol and kind of bearing witness to to the minute particulars. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, uh, yeah, we could let someone else like... Oh, sorry. No, go on, Jake. No, go on, if you had more to say. No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, because it feels like... Um... I was reading. I was reading something recently, and um, book uh, Lucy Cogan's book about kind of how prophecy changes, um, in Blake's work, and it seems like most can only kind of develop as a figure properly when the prophet becomes less a kind of active presence in the world, more a preserving presence. So I think that's central to Lois becoming a key figure for Blake. He, he's he's not like Orc was in the seventeen nineties. He's very much a preserving figure or kind of a watchful figure than he is kind of an active. Uh, he is active, but he's less kind of. He's not going to change. The world in the way that all was he's, he's that kind of prophetic yeah watchful figure i think yeah um jody is uh patiently waiting to ask a question so let's let her do that oh no i was listening to the bob dylan stuff because i'm very into ginsburg as well i don't work on ginsburg i'm just a, i'm just a fan um no so i was absolutely fascinated and it should come as no surprise to people in this chat who know me by the uh, the use of uh the the case against the astrologer um as i've actually written about that before but from a completely different perspective to you um so my article there focused on the astrologer as like criminal blah 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 so i'm coming to this um with absolute kind of fascination with like the way that the um the watchman is kind of presented by these uh these kind of these graphic like images and representations as almost like not not a, a criminal but almost kind of aligned with that and like almost like kind of like neg negligent and this negligent negligence has allowed kind of the spread of crime and so i was wondering if you'd done any work on like um criminality and any kind of sympathy with criminality in blake's work because like i was racking my brains as i was watching it trying to think okay so like no, Blake has like looking at the images like Blake has written about a sex worker, for example, at the end of London. And then the Ratcliffe murders press coverage reminded me of the uh, sooner murder an infant in its cradle from marriage. So I was wondering about like if there if Blake has said anything about like kind of crime or criminals and kind of is there's any kind of relationship between the watchman, any kind of sympathy there, because like the policing being harsh and um being a eurozenic figure and perhaps like the criminals not necessarily being wrong but like maybe acting out of you know like like um poverty or or something so i'm really interested in your perspective on that even though kind of you've just done talk on policing so yeah no thank, thank you Jody, for that question um it's not i i guess it, it's not as present in blake as it would be present in kind of the contemporary discourse about the watchman i think i think what blake kind of celebrates what i'm saying he celebrates about the watchman is what a lot of people found troublesome about the watchman which kind of linked to maybe criminal activity was the fact that they were from the parishes that they were um patrolling yeah uh, and they were sort of local figures who a lot of the time were kind of a lot older which was was part of the reason that um, people thought they weren't really fit for purpose anymore um but yes yeah, so i think a lot of the kind of worry and the call um, to, to establish a more kind of centrally um, funded kind of downward looking kind of force was that these were people who were within the community. So there's not kind of the um, the level of uh, rigor when it comes to like um, applying the law that it would, that there would be if, if it was kind of a more abstracted or kind of impersonal um, yeah. kind of set of law enforcers. Um, so I, I, I can't really think of anything too explicit in Blake, but I feel like kind of in that context, 
the idea about kind of the minute particulars of humanity that that shouldn't be reduced to like kind of an abstract idea kind of um leaves a bit of a bit of room within a community to kind of like figure itself out rather than everyone having to be like kind of um um like responsive to kind of the same same law that that isn't grounded in where they're from if that makes sense i think there's kind of a local particularity to blake's kind of idea about my new particulars that plays into a lot of the reasons why people kind of wanted to stick with the watchman and also why people kind of wanted to get rid of the watchman it's that kind of idea of like locality familiarity with kind of like a more abstract probably more efficient system but sort of the tensions between those two and so i hope that I'll... yeah no it's, it's interesting because like the watchman of course like he would know his community and he mm -hmm. might know say someone why someone would commit crime the way yeah. like blake doesn't like astrologers but he associates them like with a kind of like a very newtonian kind of prophecy um mm -hmm. so like the the astrologers in uh in his illustrations to dante with their heads turned around pretty much kind of a negative view of astrologers there mm -hmm. but um but yeah so it's the tension between kind of like an overarching one rule for everyone kind of thing versus a more kind of nuanced like but also partial biased maybe even corrupt like view of the community then like mm -hmm. there's a tension there like yeah, yeah. okay yeah i think so which, which kind of I, I suppose that that's that that lingers uh in any time really like i'm kind of talking about police and it's, it's that tension between like kind of um yeah like a set of rules that aren't locally specific and kind of how 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 that can lead to a lot of tension in, in communities and so yeah there's very much a kind of pressing thing, I think. And um, yeah, I think Blake's quite early drawing attention to it. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's very, it's very relevant to like contemporary debates about uh, policing and police funding mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, really, really, really interesting stuff to think about. Yeah, love the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I um I stuck uh, Watchman into the um you know the searchable Erdman online um mm -hmm. today just to sort of see what came up. And uh, I think it's I think it's after the passage that you quoted of him kind of going on patrol, that amazing passage in um, Jerusalem where he's talking about the various London landmarks. I think it's directly after that when Loss is sort of responding to that. And he says, I wrote it down because I thought it might be relevant. He says, uh, what shall I do? What could I do if I could find these criminals? I could not dare to take vengeance. But all things are so constructed and builded by the divine hand that the sinner shall always escape. And he who takes vengeance alone is the criminal of providence. So I wonder if that kind of ties in with it. It's, it's almost like the idea of there's that whole thing that runs through Jerusalem, right? Of the forgiveness of sins mm -hmm. as opposed to the moral law. So mm -hmm. it's, is, it, is it sort of setting up the watch as this symbol of a sort of figure who patrols the neighborhood and keeps everyone safe as opposed to a police force who's about punishment and, uh, and break, you know, yeah, punishing criminal mm -hmm. behavior. No, for sure. And oh, that's such a brilliant quote. I'd kind of I'd forgotten about that when I was writing this. I, I wish I, I wish I wish I remembered. Um yeah, no, exactly. I think as, as you say, like um, the idea of forgiveness and, um, is just written all the way through Jerusalem, really, mm. isn't it? I mean, yeah, the idea that kind of if everything's composed of minute particulars, the only way to um degrade them is to like kind of try and uh, just take take away this specific quality that's in them so like that that's the damage that's been done any kind of punishment is um it's, it's not going to be anything positive it's not going to be anything that's going to undo sort of the damage that's that's been done to the in particulars and um, i get i guess the idea that kind of um everything's composed of the same thing not very blatant idea and it's the state that they're in that kind of um defines or like structures its position in the world and how it interacts with other things um so yeah, I, I guess it's the idea that um, yeah, kind of like punishment isn't going to um, isn't going to be anything positive in the long run. And um, yeah, as you say, I think that that ties into um, the watchman's role. It's not so much a um, active kind of preemptive attempt to kind of to to set the world up along along its own lines. It's kind of a watchful mm. presence that kind of intervenes when it has to, and kind of obviously doesn't let horrific things happen but kind of kind of reacts rather than 
initiates, I suppose, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anise has also had her little hand icon up very patiently. Anise. Hi, Jake. Amazing. Absolutely uh, loved it. Oh, Guess what you. I'm going to ask about? The four Zoras, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you a question <laughs> about the four Zoras. Four um, Zoras or uh, Tauchin. Could be either. <laughs> um, no, it's kind of more of a, I'm going to use that phrase, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, so you use like two quotes from Night the Seventh. Um, yes. Yep. But they're from the different versions of Night the Seventh, because you know there's a Night the Seventh A and a Night the Seventh B. Yeah. 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 Um, and then obviously a Night the Seventh B, which is written afterwards, although loss as a character is changed in Night the Seventh A after Night the Seventh B is written. I've done a lot. If you want to talk about Night the Seventh, I can go on for ages. Um, the in Night the Seventh B, which is the part with the Watchman that you you quoted the bit the Enathamon talks about. Mm-hmm. And you've been talking about like uh, loss as the opposite of Eurizun and and the police and thing, because Eurizun doesn't actually engage with Orc in like the seventh B. It's it he engage he gets he gets the shadowy female to do it for him mm-hmm. as like an agent of he's like a police detective and he sends her out as like a DC and mm-hmm. it's kind of like I wondered if if there was kind of, especially when the other the other part that you had quoted was from Night the Seventh A which obviously is uh, with the books where Eurizen and uh, Orc have that amazing like battle off um, but I wondered the, the idea that, that Eurizen has these kind of agents of chaos i guess is probably the best phrase and that he he's sort of like he doesn't have to be involved or whether there was kind of any kind of like connection to what you were saying about police and, and watchmen in that way yeah thank you Anise. thank you um i i'm very cavalier sometimes in sort of my quotations of the four zeros so thank you for reminding me that i should definitely double check um sort of which which version it comes from um yeah so uh it's interesting with Eurozone because I, I think um, like, I, I really like because it, it does recur quite a lot, doesn't it? Kind of the um, the, the structure that emerges from him, the, the 7A kind of version of the four zones. And I, I really like it. I'm, I brought it up in the talk, the um, the bit in the book of Eurozone where it's kind of him, he, his net sort of is an elevated thing. And it kind of, even though it's not directly connected to the people below, it kind of affects the senses and affects like kind of people's movement and things like that. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's almost like kind of a, something that isn't always necessarily imposed. It's something that people kind of impose upon themselves through like a way of thinking or like kind of um, processing the world. So I suppose it's it's hard with viewers, isn't it? Because I, I don't, I really don't want this talk. I don't want to put some sort of binary opposition between yours and, and Lois because they're obviously connected in so many different ways and sort of blend into each other and each other's spaces. But I think, yeah, just, just him as kind of, a point of, of abstract or geometric order that that Lois tries to like complicate what I'm doing in some ways, and and that it, it, it happens in so many ways for our plate, doesn't it? It's kind of it, it's something that people internalize and kind of like do for themselves. It's things that he that is actively sort of created by yours and sometimes, um, yeah. No, I, it, yes, it's tough. He's kind of he's kind of a a shadowy presence throughout so much of Blake and I think so much of what's interesting about his work is the variety of ways in which he is represented and the variety of ways in which different figures at different points try to rethink or kind of undo some of the certainty that Eurism um has has put in place. Because I, I know you're I know you're a big fan of yours. <laughs> like it. Yeah. Um can I just take it a little bit further? Yeah. Is that okay. Um so if so the loss of Night the Seventh Day, if you if you read like Peter Otto and others, they discuss this idea that that that's what's most important about Night the Seventh Day is the fact that loss is suddenly the loss that you see in like Jerusalem and in mm-hmm. Milton rather than the loss of like the Lambeth Prophecies, who is kind of a dark, horrible character because he's not really quite he's not a nice character really. He's not like the redemptive feature in Jerusalem. Yeah. And whether um so I always use Keynes because when you're doing Night the Seventh you and you need two versions Keynes is easier than trying to work it out with Erdman um but whether like there's a difference in the kind of 
the way he's set up as because obviously it's not the seventh B, which has him compared to the Watchman and and Asamon saying be like a Watchman. But whether there was a part in like the seventh A that was sort of more Jerusalemly, if you I don't know how to say that. More like Jerusalem. More he sort of he he's he's he seems to get on a lot more with Enathamon and takes this kind of he's a much more watchful figure, if you like, in the kind of way that he watches her and he says things and he's 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 sort of more um it's not really watchful that's not quite the right word he's sort of aware of his situation much more than he is in night the seventh b he spends a lot of time going oh yeah in a thumb on you're my light you're my joy and she's like yes thank you loss and they have this kind of much more involved rather than disengaged thing um relationship and i wondered whether that was something that you had might want to think about I've, I've, I've definitely go into that. I haven't really, um, I've not um, thought too much about sort of the differences between Lois in 7A and 7B. So thank you for drawing attention to that. I will do that. Just in general, I could be wrong here, but I always, maybe I'll, I'll look into this and maybe, maybe this will change the way that I think about it. But I, I've always thought this, even though Lois, as you say, is meant to kind of emerge as the fully formed figure that he is in kind of Jerusalem and like Milton to a lesser extent in the Four Zoras, I always think there's a real, difference between um Lois then and Lois later on and I think a big part of that which is kind of not as involved in what I'm talking about now is like the, the role that the Spectre plays and the difference that uh, the Spectre of Athona Othona is characterised in Four Zoras compared to Jerusalem I think um Lois is a bit more I know he, he seems a bit more um it seems like Blake puts a lot on him in the Four Zoras that he's actually going to be able to do which doesn't really quite sustain itself in Jerusalem I think he, I, I, I could be wrong there do, do you agree at least is that kind of a fair comment on four zoas or yes I think the loss of the four zoas is um I think all the characters in the four zoas are a development anyway they're a, it's a bit of a very long railing pong period it's like 10 10 years or so so it's it's not a sh it's not like written in like mm. 20 minutes um but yeah, L Loss is really, really developing in the Four Zoas, and he he sort of starts off as one thing, becomes another, goes back a bit, and 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 yeah, Blake's like, I don't know what to do with him, and then by the time he's right, Milton, he's like, I know now, <laughs> okay, I've sorted, I've sorted Loss out. So yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. Thanks, Anise. I don't think it, I don't, it might have just be my screen, but Anise's visuals were ever so slightly glitching then. And I thought it was like some sort of Eurozenic surveillance takeover. I don't know. Um, Jennifer had her hand up a while ago. Jennifer, did you still want to ask something or comment? Well, I wouldn't mind if there aren't other questions. Uh, yeah, I really yeah, appreciated please. your talk. Um, and I can see, um, you know, you're arguing that. Blake champions the Watchman figure uh, as a resistance against the centralized tyranny of the police system. And in some of the illustrations that you showed, um, you know, as an example of the public debate of the time, watch these Watchmen were portrayed in, in that um, in that in that in those venues as, as a, in farcical terms. Mm -hmm. And so I was interested to see, you know. Is there evidence to show us what these watchmen really were like? Um, I would be interested if you would build that up a little bit more. You in in our question and answer, you've already said you know they they were they were local. They were from their own parishes. They tended to be older, uh, maybe less rigorous in applying the law, but applying it in a more personal way because they knew these people. Of course, that could also be taken as you know a different kind of corruption. Um, but the, the fact that the watchman would know their community and be working in the interests of that community to protect it. Are there other things about that we know about what the, these watchmen were actually like that might help us kind of flesh out um, Blake's tropes? Mm -hmm. but thank you, Jim. That's a really, really interesting question. Um, so from, from what I found from what kind of reading kind of accounts on the watchman at the time and then um, looking at images is that, so I mentioned the kind of 1774 um, legislation, which was kind of a more professionalization of the watch. By the time we get into the 19th century, it seems like that 
hasn't really had too much effect. Um, there is a problem with um, the watch kind of being older people who who aren't as active um, as as they as they would have been. Um, there is that there, there does seem like there is a lot of problems with the watch as a system that can police kind of a metropolis that was growing to the size that London was. And so I, I mentioned it briefly in like a response to the um, Ratcliffe murders, but that, that book um, by John Prince Smith, which um, sort of kind of exhibits an experiment that he undertook in his own parish um, to try and have that as an example of what other parishes could do. I think um, in, in his account, there's an awareness that the watch isn't kind of up to scratch as it is in its current iteration, but there's enough in the system itself that if it if it's perfected or if it if it's improved, then it, it can persist and, and they don't have to rely on kind of a centralized um system. So what he did, I think, was he he got every kind of every sort of I think I think it was it was it was only males, I think, in the in the parish, but um got them to kind of sign up to a a kind of rotor system and it wasn't it wasn't paid but it was kind of the idea that a community that it, like an investment in the community so that that's an experiment that they undertook for two weeks i think and he, he wrote about it and said it was it was a great success like um because they were sharing the works between different people um people were less tired um people felt more of a kind of a, a sense of the space that they lived in and there was a lot of like camaraderie between people undertaking the work um so yeah just sorry to answer your question i think it, it's quite clear from what i've seen that the watchman was kind of a the, the watch was a failing institution at the time when kind of blake was writing this but there were enough people who saw its problems but also believed in the institution itself that it had the potential to um to improve and to kind of meet the demands of a modern city which i think um obviously it's, it's a lot of um extrapolation talking about blake's views on these things but it seems from from what he was writing, I think I think that's probably a system that he'd be more on board with than um, than sort of the, the the system that came in eighteen twenty nine. Thank you. Thinking about that and and the um, the watch perhaps being made of older gentlemen, I suddenly thought of um, Dad's Army. <laughs> Just now, I want like a sitcom about the the London watch in the late eighteenth century. It could be good. It's definitely an overlap. Definitely that. <laughs> um, we had a, a comment in the chat from uh, from our esteemed secretary Stephen Pritchard mm -hmm. um, about uh, the Watcher in Marvel Comics. Um, always up talking about comics. Um, could I ask, in a sort of meta moment, for Stephen Pritchard to reveal himself as that he is the behind the scenes Watcher, who is one of the two. Uh, behind the scenes tech wizards who keeps this all going. Stephen, would you want to um, appear and share your thoughts on this? Yes, um, it was a bit spontaneous. I didn't want to, um, well, I don't think it is lowering the tone at all, is it, with um, the Marvel Universe? It's about yeah. archetype and myth, isn't it? And as a teenager reading my Marvel comics and and somewhat into uh, into the current time, um, the Watcher, I thought, why on earth would you have a superhero who just watches? But they've got, you know, if you know the Watchers, this vast being, um, and he watches the earth. That's his specific responsibility. And when stuff happens, he's aware of it and he sort of takes it in. He also evolves, like, like Loss. He does intervene, uh, unlike Doctor Who, who's not meant to ever intervene, but always does, the Watcher. He sort of works up to it. And when it gets really serious, he does he does make an intervention. And in that sense, he is this um, he's this policeman who has has the universe under surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and he has that sort of all seeing aspect. It's, you know, he's always figured standing, looking at the earth as a sort of distant thing. But then we also see the little cutaways whereby you can see events going on and things approaching the earth and, and threatening it. Um, so, yeah, myth and archetype. And I was thinking about Vishnu as well, Vishnu the Preserver, who, again, like like Loss, he, he's not like Brahma the Creator or Shiva the Destroyer. He's, he sits in the middle and he just keeps things in in place. Um, Loss spends a lot of time doing that. A lot of time he's working really fast to make things stand still. 
as he evolves at the forge and he's uh, uh yeah and there's the, the business of um not one moment is is lost uh men run on in the current of time and not one thing is lost and not one moment so that was my thinking really it just sort of burbled up into my head no it's really interesting i must confess my ignorance i'm not too up on marvel so i don't really know the watcher too well i know a bit more about like watchmen and the, the graphic novel um but no no it's quite interesting because as you say it's not really a like watching is not really a characteristic that you'd normally associate with like a superhero it's not really like batman or spider-man is but it's, it's a it's a yeah like in, in mythology and kind of in a lot of um mediums it's, it's something that's integral to to yeah to, to things happening because like it, go, going back to the euros and life's um kind of opposition Eurozone's a lot more creative than Los is, I suppose. Like he kind of creates the mundane show at, at the start of the um, the four zones. A lot of the um, a lot of the rules of the world and sort of the forms of the world come from like kind of the Eurozonic impulse. So yeah, Los, Los is kind of not not the creator, but kind of the shaper or the preserver, as you say. So it's yeah, it's inter it's interesting to kind of think about the tension between like kind of thinking of preserving or watching as kind of being inactive, but the kind of the active qualities that can be wrapped up in in watching, I suppose. But really interesting. Well, actually, yeah, I've not thought much about that. Strangely heroic, really. Yeah, yeah. Don't think this is part of the hero's journey. Yeah, I'd yeah. watch this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I my... If that's sort of part of, like, the innate... Um, just the sort of innate sympathies of an artist, right? Because if you're... Mm -hmm. Particularly at that stage in Blake's life, when he's, when he's writing the, you know, Melton and Jerusalem where, you know, I guess it's becoming clear to him that the political uh, changes that he hopes to see earlier aren't going to happen. And also his, the, the, the sort of career he hoped for isn't going to materialise, you know, probably, that there's something heroic about bearing witness, about mm -hmm. just, you know, writing or painting and and creating as, a, as an act of, like, witnessing uh life you know yeah for sure no, Bla blake definitely seems to have kind of hope that that's what people would think about him what, what's the quote about him sort of he he stuck with the divine vision even in times of trouble i think i think he oh, wow. repeats that two or three times i think he was really hammering home that he, he did keep the divine vision in times of trouble and the fact that we're kind of talking about him now two centuries later i suppose can't really argue that I suppose he did in some ways. Yeah. Mm. I think you're really right, John and Jake. It's witness, isn't it? And it's hold, mm. holding something, not letting it slip away, not letting mm. it disappear. That's me done. I'm going to dematerialize. Even before you dematerialize, is is the Watcher the one who in Marvel Comics the one who looks like a massive baby? Or am I thinking? Yes, of... He's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he seems to be vast. And he's, yeah. Yeah, he's completely bald yeah. and he has a sort of winged collar. Yeah, and yeah. I, I couldn't work out why I found it so compelling, but I absolutely did. And it is because I think it's, uh, you know, it is that very powerful archetype. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. You've got me going like nerd pop culture now as, as my one of my favourite places to go. But with the mention of Doctor Who as well, it's interesting, right? Because like when you showed that... Um, uh cartoon that sort of uh yeah uh, was it from i think it was from the um i forget jake the name of the novel about tom and jerry uh oh, um, life, life in london yeah where they're where they're tipping over the what and presumably the the the, the watchman's you know that's the presumably the predecessor to the police box which of course is the tardis right so yeah, of course yeah. maybe there's some sort of weird sympathy there as well yeah yeah oh yeah i hadn't thought about that That'd be yeah. It'd be it'd be good to do like a kind of prequel for Doctor Who where he's just a, a watchman, drunk yeah. watchman, sort of going around in <laughs> watch, 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 watch. Yeah. <laughs> But myth just uh, takes on the the uh, appearance of the culture and the time that it's in, doesn't it? But the the central thing is the same mm -hmm. archetype. Yeah. I think I need to go now before I disgrace myself. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Ah, Jennifer's raised her hand again. Please rejoin us, Jennifer. I don't know how, you know, this, to, what to make of it, but of course there are also watchers in in scripture. Uh, the book of Daniel, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a positive image of 
a kind of a category of angel that is being sent down to watch over human beings. Um, there are more ambiguous images in the book of, of Enoch. Um, Blake would certainly have known both of these uh, images also uh, sent down to protect human beings, but then they start having their own ideas about things and they start having sex with the human women and, and that gives birth to the Nephilim and, you know, Blake does some things there with the Nephilim and some of the, his illustrations. So I don't know how any of that plays in, but the image of the watchers as a, a spiritual, spiritual guardians mm -hmm. uh, who are kind of good, good, good and evil angels mm. is certainly there. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. It's kind of it's not something I've really thought about in relation to this, but the actual, the actual practice of watching and what the dynamic of watching actually is, and there's, there's so many echoes of that, but obviously biblical kind of pop culture that have, that have come up tonight. So, no, thank you, thank you. It's really interesting to yeah, absolutely. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a raised hand from Sibylla. Sibylla, please join us. Thank you. Um. I enjoyed your talk a lot and listening to all the wonderful questions that you've had, I suddenly thought about the seeing theme itself. I mean, yours is often depicted as blind. Is that then just a simple metaphor that he watches but doesn't actually see anything? Or does that, have you thought about the seeing theme and then um, you become what you behold and if the doors of perception, how does that play into what you've been so brilliantly explaining? Thank you. Thank you for that question. That's really interesting. That's not something that I had thought about, but off just off the top of my head, I suppose it just it it does kind of reinforce the idea that if Eurozone's kind of promoting these kind of abstracted or kind of pre-planned systems, there's almost not really a need to see if if you're hmm. if 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 the thing that you're promoting kind of you, you expect it to to work as like kind of a mechanism or something you know exactly how it's gonna it's gonna go whereas watching is the action of not knowing exactly what the permutations of that are so so it's, it's a again going back to like kind of the act of watching it it's it's a real concentration to kind of see what the divergences are from what kind of from those systems i, I suppose um mm -hmm. No, no, Thank that's you. that's really interesting. Yeah, no, um, okay. and then the doors of perception again. I suppose as well. That's like kind of, it's it's a gateway. It's a, it's a way of looking out into things. That's kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the the process of looking. It's the process of. Yeah, and the doors doors of perception. They popped into my head because he chose the gate. So he goes mm -hmm. into. I've always thought of, of him going into the underworld or going mm -hmm. into the the depth of um, Jerusalem, again, thinking of it as a metaphor, we don't know what yeah. to find in this. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, just, sorry, just to talk about Gates, because I've, I've kind of done a bit of work on this. What I love about Gates in Blake is that it kind of made me rethink what a gate is. Like, if a wall is kind of a, a thing that cuts off two spaces entirely, a gate's something that allows two spaces to interact while still preserving the, the separation between them, which I think is a very kind of loose action isn't it it's kind of preserving and differentiating but communicating kind of between the two if that isn't too abstract and make some sort of sense I hope you thank you thank you very thank much you. thank you uh and Anise is back sorry hello <laughs> <laughs> no it was it's it's building on something Sibylla was talking about this idea of like watching and I was thinking um Sorry, it's about the four Zoas. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of times in the four Zoas where characters watch other characters do things, but don't mm. get involved. Especially like, say, Ahani is always watching, especially after years and like Chucks are in the, in the, in the void. Or mm. like Vela watches things happening. But they often, I don't know why my screen is glitching. I apologize. Um, but there's a lot of like times where characters watch other character and you're told they're watching mm -hmm. the other character do things and you're watching it through them um in the same way that there are also times when you're told that they're saying things or singing things but you're not told what they're being what is being said so it's mm -hmm. i wouldn't i wondered if there's this kind of idea that you watch through the watchers rather than you be so that the, the reader or the audience themselves has to become 
the watcher yeah that's that's really interesting in relation to the four zeros because i guess my it, it it's such an interesting kind of work because it's like a lot more it's, it's a real kind of um factory for blake isn't it like to kind of work a lot of stuff out and all the different versions of it and all the all the additions um so i the way i the way i kind of think of the four zeros and, and to sort of play into that is um they're all a bit suspicious of each other in the four zeros aren't they they're all kind of working each other out and part of the fun of reading it is that you kind of don't really know who's telling the truth and you're getting all these partial narratives that you sort of like kind of don't quite build up to to a coherent story and you get all these snapshots that kind of over overlay each other and sort of yeah yeah so it, it's that's really interesting it's kind of a different form of watching i suppose to like kind of what what most is meant to be doing in jerusalem it's kind of yeah it's, it's like kind of if they're in court or something it's like kind of who do you believe who's 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 right who, who's got the yeah no really, really interesting i've thought a lot more about like the actual act of watching different types of watching today than i've had done before so thank you thanks anise uh, Helen um, has popped in the chat, and I think this may have been uh, in particularly in response to um, Jennifer talking about the biblical watching angels, I'm guessing, uh, Wings of Desire, Vin Vendors, uh, which is, uh, yeah, many years since I saw that film, but that's the those amazing black and white shots of the angels looking down on Berlin. Am I right? I think I'm right. Um, yeah, which is an interesting... Um, comparison i reckon we've got time for one more question if anyone wants to um jump in uh we'll sort of wrap up about nine i think any more questions for jake before we lose the opportunity for now ah i think uh here we go yeah oh uh, you said yeah brilliant um I, I always think that um like met uh, as lost walking the streets was perhaps even putting a lock in it now and again because uh, it was quite illegal for him to be walking the streets in those days at night because it was considered trouble if you had no proper business and of course he met lots of prostitutes uh, social uh, sexual workers who um, I think he, uh, I think he was possibly even tempted but of course did nothing about it mm -hmm. but uh, at least sort of like Bala figures and uh, I think uh, there's one in Jerusalem on the, in the, in the uh, section 17 I think he actually bumps into a Bala figure yeah. mm -hmm. um, I don't have any specific question except that he must have known Lots of, uh, of the watchmen of London who yeah. regularly going round all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, no, the, oh, sorry, sorry. No, and so he must have made sort of some sort of relationship with them in order to pass through. Mm -hmm. No, for, for sure, it's, it's it's one of those sad things about Blake that there's not kind of more records because there must be so many interactions with people in London or like London institutions that we don't know about that. We, tell us so much more about his relationship with the city that he lived in. But it's re really interesting thinking about him knowing the watchman and also talking about the kind of nighttime and the transgression that kind of comes along with nighttime. I, suppose, I didn't really talk about this, but there's there's a real difference in the kind of the Bobbies and the Charlies in that you think of kind of the uniform police in the daytime a lot of the time, like kind of on their beat. Whereas the watchman, uh, except in like very rare circumstances were only active at night so th thank you for bringing that up i've not really thought about that kind of um contrast between like kind of working in the day and working in the night because i think there's there's probably a lot there that kind of fits into losis role as, as watchman so no, thank you i'm gonna keep thinking about that um i think we probably better call it a night in a moment um just before we go i was just one more thing jake um when i when i put in um watchman in into watchman into the erdman search i was really interested to see the first instance that comes up is actually in um songs of innocence in uh i think is it just called a dream the that funny little poem about the 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 emmet which i think is an oh, animal yeah. who's sort of lost and there's actually uh i think the glow worm 
uh, compares itself, calls itself, what does it say? It calls itself the Watchman of the Night and kind of helps the Beetle uh, guide the um, the Emmett uh, home. So again, I guess it's that sense of like a community uh, assistance sort of role rather than a sort of, yeah, like a punishing sort of crime role. Yeah, no, that's really interesting to have it that early on as well. Because yeah. I suppose that the way that I've been thinking about it is, is that something that kind of develops out of the 1790s and, and sort of breaks, sort of turns more emphasis on forgiveness. So it's really interesting to have that reference early on. So, yeah. yeah, amazing. Thanks for about that. Thank you. Well, Dave, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you, everyone, for all your questions and attention. Um, I think we've all got like uh, lots to think about and hopefully given Jake a few more sort of sparks off a few different angles and thoughts as well. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd better call it a night there. Just before we go, um, just again to remind everyone about the um, event next month, October the 2nd. Songs of Innocence and of Experience. There we go. A lovely visual reminder for you all. So, yeah, those who are able to get to London, I realise that we've got sort of people from other um, countries and, and other uh, towns joining us this evening. Uh, but if you are able to join us, uh, it should be a fantastic night. It promises to be very um, interesting as well. So hope to see you there. But for tonight, thank you again to Jake. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. And um, we hope to see you all very soon at future uh, Blake Society events. Thanks very much.